Good evening. Uh, my name is Renee Barnes, and I'm Director of Operations here at Federal Hall for the Harbor Conservancy. Um, we are the nonprofit partner for this site and six other historic sites in New York City. Um, on behalf of the National Park Service and our Conservancy, welcome to Federal Hall. Many of you may recognize Federal Hall as the site where George Washington was inaugurated and the Bill of Rights enacted. Um, but for tonight, even more rev relevant perhaps is that this was also the site of New York State Capitol after the Revolutionary War. Here at Federal Hall, in our interpretation, we see all the historic events that happen here as the foundation for today's work in progress. And so we're truly honored this evening to host New York, Humanities New York and this very important discussion. So without much ado, please welcome to the stage Executive Director of Humanities New York, Sarah Ogre. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Renee. I'm Sarah Ogre, Executive Director of Humanities New York, and thank you so much for coming out this evening. Humanities New York is the host, but we couldn't have pulled this event off without the help of our friends and partners. So first, I would like to thank Renee again and everyone at both Federal Hall National Memorial and the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy for this partnership that allows us to present in this amazing civic and historic space. Thank you. We also want to acknowledge our sponsor, Harvard University Press, as well as some important outreach partners, the Vera Institute of Justice at New York University, the Center for Justice, and the Heyman Center for the Humanities, both at Columbia University. All of you have helped so much getting the word out and drawing this great crowd, thank you. Uh, one program change. I'm disappointed to say that uh, though we expected to have Elizabeth Hinton with us tonight, Unfortunately, she had to return to Boston unexpectedly for a family emergency. We'll go on, though, um, without Elizabeth and our other panelists will serve. Humanities New York is an independent 501c3. We're also the state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The mission of Humanities New York is to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community using the humanities to foster engaged inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. What does that mean? At Humanities New York, we don't think of the humanities as a set of disciplines, history, literature, philosophy, etc., but as a set of tools for improving civic life. The most basic of these tools should be ubiquitous and still remain difficult to encourage open, frank, and substantive dialogue about the hopes anxieties and obstacles that unite us or divide us. These practices support our best institutions of informal democracy. And we know this to be a key to the health of American society and democracy. This type of conversation, structured and informed, yet supple and nimble enough to respond to the opinions and experiences of participants, is a strength of the public humanities. We encourage this kind of engagement, not only through events like this, but through our grant making and through such programs as community conversations and reading and discussion groups. All of our offerings strive to help New Yorkers form and articulate their ideas and beliefs and to develop critical thinking, analysis, synthesis, and problem solving skills. All leadership skills, if you think about that that help us talk about and understand the ideas that define us as individuals and connect us to our communities. Through our work, we have strived to show how the humanities remain vital to both personal development and civic discourse. Which brings me to tonight. Uh, tonight's event is part of the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Initiative, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils in partnership with the Pulitzer Prizes. The initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, and journalism, and an informed citizenry. We thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their generous support of this initiative, which involves state humanities councils in most of the different states. On this given night, a few of us are probably running a program. As our contribution to democracy and the informed citizen, Humanities New York will host a four-part series and this is the first, 
addressing a host of pressing contemporary issues. The next event will also be held here at Federal Hall and will feature Isabel Wilkerson, the author of the magisterial history of the Great Migration called The Warmth of Other Suns. Isabel will be in conversation with some others, we're still choosing them, about the historical, cultural, and social impact of American demographic change. So you can find more information about this event on your program on the back that you picked up when you came in. So the title of this evening's discussion is After Attica, Criminal Justice and Mass Incarceration. So why is Humanities New York addressing this issue or how is it a humanities and not say a policy question? Because it's both. As with so much recent historical scholarship has proven, these very subjects of the war on drugs, police, policing and incarceration, and the type of social protest and control that we see in the news this very day uh, has its roots in American history. As both Heather Ann Thompson and Michael Winrep have shown in their work, these issues are alive and well. Prisons and their related issues are an instance of us as a nation being within the history we seek to understand. And without understanding, there can be no humane policy which isn't to say that this is an easy conversation to participate in, not at all. As with, as with so many topics these days, it is often hard to attribute sincerity to those we disagree with. And it's hard to engender enough civic trust to talk through the realities of the day and to begin speculating on the immense work necessary to remediate those realities. From our perspective, if there is any hope of recovering or creating for the first time broad civic trust among the many residents of this country, it will require frank grappling with this history and a sincere engagement with the present. I mentioned the programs uh, that we run at Humanities New York, and one very important thing about how we practice the public humanities is that the programming doesn't have to be top down. We aren't here solely to have our panelists educate you. Rather, it's about dialogue. So look around at this group a little bit. Don't you want to know each other a bit more? I think so. Uh, so you're going to be a big part of the conversation. Uh, in order to draw on the expertise, both on the stage and in the room, we're going to structure the panel a little bit differently than a standard panel. So the presentation part will be broken down into three sections. Each will be followed by a audience Q&A. So we're not just waiting to the very end. We'll start a Q&A one third of the way. First, we'll discuss some of the history of the American prison system, and second, we'll discuss some of our panelists' work and question how they go about doing this investigative type of work on such volatile issues. And last, we'll look at recent developments in criminal justice reform and what we might hope for in the future. So after each of these sections, uh, we will have the Q&A of about 10 minutes, give or take. Since time is limited, we ask you to keep your questions super brief, like under 30 seconds. Try. Uh, we will have microphones for you to use, so you'll take a microphone, ask your quick question, hand it right back after your short question. So we're going to start with something for the audience members. Um, I'm going to ask you all a question. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, preferably the one you don't already know, and discuss your answer for just a few minutes. I'll, cut, I'll time you, I mean I'll cut you off, and you don't have to share what you said to anybody. Just keep it to yourselves and speak frankly. So the question is, what is it about the topic of tonight's event and conversation that's important to you? And why do you think it's important? So please think about that briefly. Turn to your neighbor, the one you don't know, and talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when to stop. This is, it's hard to, it's hard to stop you. I'm sorry to do it. I love the sound you're all making. That's exactly what we want. So our panelists have taken the stage and uh, my next job is to introduce our moderator who will in turn introduce our guest speakers. So tonight's conversation will be led by Toussaint Logier. Toussaint is an assistant professor in the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies at University of Massachusetts Amherst. His research focuses on grassroots responses to the post-war emergence 
of mass incarceration in Chicago. At UMass Amherst, he teaches courses on African American history, black politics, criminal justice, law and policy, and transnational social movements. Thank you for coming out. Please welcome Toussaint Lozier. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, just trying to make sure you guys didn't fall asleep during those, that little three minute uh, introduction. Um, I have the uh, wonderful pleasure of um, introducing uh, the folks who are gonna make up uh, this evening's panel um, for what I hope will be a very informative discussion uh, about a very important and topical manner, matter. Um, to uh, my left is uh, Michael Weinrip, uh, a former investigative reporter uh, for the New York Times, uh, who was a 2017 uh, finalist for reporting on uh, New York State prisons um, and played a particularly important role in revealing um, uh, important cases of brutality that were taking place behind bars and really shining a light on um, aspects of the uh, correctional system here in New York that oftentimes don't get a fair amount of attention. Um, and to his left is Heather Ann Thompson, who is the author of Blood in the Water, uh, The Attica Prison Uprising and Its Legacy, uh, which was the winner of the 2017 Pulitzer for History. Um, Professor Thompson is also um, uh, teaches at the University of Michigan in the Departments of History, as well as Afro-American and Afro-American Studies. Um, and I have the pleasure, as well as at, uh, of being a, uh, a faculty fellow, um, a visiting scholar fellow at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History um, at Harvard University uh, with Professor Thompson at this time right now, 2017-2018 um, year. And um, we're gonna just start off our conversation pretty generally um, with a question that I think is important to cover uh, when it comes to discussions of um, uh, questions of uh, incarceration here in the United States. Um, one of the basic questions that I think um, most folks at least have some sense of, but really also have a fair amount of questions about are um, really the, the origins of mass incarceration. Um, and I just wanted to ask you too, if you could give us some sense of um, uh, how we got to where we are at this day and age in terms of mass incarceration and um, how American policy towards crime has developed in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us all here. Um, and thank you, Toussaint, for that introduction. Um, that's a great place to start because I think that uh, we're getting better at understanding that the system we have today is strange and weird and historically unprecedented, but it goes uh, to the heart of everything we're gonna talk about tonight, I think, how unusual this moment is. And it's not unusual in terms of its racial disproportionality, it's not unusual in terms of the abuses that go behind, go on behind bars and the terrible working conditions in prisons. It's unusual though in its sheer size and its sheer scope. Um, we have not had this many people locked up ever in American history and no country has ever had this many people locked up. And so there's lots of reasons why we got here, but I wanna just say that the reason we got here was not crime. And that tends to be the real, uh, the real eye-opener, I think, for a lot of people. We tend to think about this as something that begins when it does because crime was out of control. And for those of us who study this intimately, we can assure you that whereas crime has gone up and down throughout American history, the responses to it have been very specific to the moment. And in this moment, which was 1965, we really began a whole new approach to dealing with social ills. It was on the heels of rebellions in Rochester and Philly and across the urban north that uh, very quickly we began to criminalize space in new ways. And the upshot of the story is uh, within four decades, we had mass incarceration, and it was more racially disproportionate than it had ever been, uh, larger than it had ever been, and, uh, and, and more profitable, frankly, than it had ever been. Uh, but we chose it. It was a policy choice, not a crime imperative. Crime will start to rise, uh, but many have argued that, in fact, mass incarceration 
uh, creates more violence rather than solves it. And uh, I think we're um, missing to some degree Elizabeth's voice uh, on this because I think her, her work on um, the crime bill of 1965 and really the, um, the way in which the war on crime uh, under the Johnson administration um, you know, came sort of hand in hand with some of the work that the Johnson administ administration also did in terms of the war on poverty um, and really helped set the stage from going to going from a moment where we had about 200,000 people in prison all across this country during the 1960s and early 1970s to um, our current moment where we have 2.2, 2.3 million people behind bars. Really that scale of, of our prison population sort of is kind of what really typifies mass incarceration. Um, at least during that, uh, the growth of the, the prison system and really the emergence of mass incarceration, Heather, uh, what was happening in prisons across the nation uh, prior to Attica, um, prior to that uprising, and um, how did the national scene influence, if at all, the different parties involved at Attica, the prisoners, the COs, the governor, Governor Rockefeller, the media, um, kind of what was happening um, at the moment that um, some of the images uh, that are kind of are behind us and really kind of give us the best, our best understanding of what was taking place in Attica, what was taking place at that moment. Well, one of the interesting things is even though the war on crime really begins in 1965, the prison uh, rate was actually still pretty steady for quite some time. It doesn't really peak or start to go up, I should say, until after Attica. And that is in part because there was a tremendous amount of civil rights activism going on in prisons at that time. And if you would have polled most Americans in 1970, I've actually looked at these polls, most Americans actually believe that the death penalty should, should not happen that uh, prisoners deserve basic human rights and that we should move towards fewer prisons, in other words, decarceration. And it was in this moment of sort of optimism and activism that at Attica, you had prisoners and guards alike recognizing that this institution was barbaric. Uh, you know, prisoners being fed on 63 cents a day, um, uh, medical care being horrific, guards working way too many hours without enough, without enough assistance, and it was a powder keg in essence, but it was one that was going to turn not just into a chaotic riot, but actually a really important rebellion because the people inside had been really discussing the issues on the inside as actively as, for example, civil rights activists were discussing them on the outside. So uh, it wasn't just rampant complaining, it was a real articulation of we can do this thing differently, we need to do it differently, and we are going to demand that we do it differently. And what were, in what ways were the men uh, in the Attica Rebellion um, raising concerns not just about the conditions of their confinement, but also um, the way in which the institution tried to gratuit gratuitously control them as well? Well, certainly the demands, once the, once the uprising begins, which is September 9th, 1971, um, there's a real extraordinary process, democratic process of coming up with the demands that these guys will uh, bring forth to the state. And those are quite basic, actually, you know, things like decent food and sure. things like, um, you know, protection from abuse and uh, more Spanish-speaking guards and so forth. So those were the demands. But in the actual yard, when you were listening to the speeches and, and people were really articulating what had brought them to this moment, they use the language of humanity. You know, we are human beings. We are not beasts. We refuse to be beaten and driven as such, as L.D. Barclay said. It was really an articulation of uh, resistance to racism in the, uh, in the prison and um, a real articulation that this had to change, that, that the world was watching. Incidentally, you know, this is a filmed uprising, and that's very deliberate because the guys inside knew uh, that prisons are closed off from everybody and that it was really important to shine the light inside. Uh, and when they did, um, the world watched for four days and four nights while they, while they made forth that, those demands. And just to um, kind of round out at least um, like a, a synopsis of kind of what took place in Attica, I think if anybody wants to get a more detailed account um, your book is a wonderful place for them to go to, and I think the book is available, um, is on sale here. Um, in, in, in responding to the, to the Attica Rebellion, 
Attica Rebellion by looking to repress it, to, to, um, to really uh, wipe it away. Um, what are the ways in which the, um, the New, York, New York State uh, Police Department, the uh, state troopers, um, the administration of the state under Rockefeller at that time, how did they talk about what the prisoners were doing and their actions in a way that also, I think, in some ways sets the stage for how people think about um, questions of incarceration today? Well, first you should know that even to answer those questions, it took me almost 13 years because the state of New York has still, did then and has still shut down most of the records related to Attica. Wow. So uh, even though this is a state institution, just answering those basic questions uh, was, a, was a challenge. But in short, the answer is that the state of New York and the federal government from the moment that this uprising began were on the scene trying to undermine it. The FBI was uh, circulating rumors of prisoner atrocities. Um, bulletins were going straight up to the, you know, not just the president, the vice president, but the FBI, the CIA, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. Um, and uh, meanwhile, about 600 state troopers from all over the state of New York and corrections officers from surrounding prisons were descending on Attica. They were passing out weapons indiscriminately deer hunting rifles, shotguns, ammunition outlawed by the Geneva Convention. And despite the fact that this was a very successful negotiation that was going on, that many parties were involved in and, and interested in resolving peacefully, we now know uh, that the Rockefeller administration really had no intention of settling this peacefully uh, and that there was going to be a brutal assault. There was a brutal assault, uh, in fact, a massacre, uh, and the book details that as well. I just wanted to say one thing. What Heather was talking about in 1971 is still a problem today. Reporters can't get access to prisons and jails. Um, we only do it in a circuitous way. Um, and when you think about the fact that these are public institutions funded by us and um, we're kept out on the grounds of uh, security, um, which is um, a bogus issue, um, it's distressing 50 years later it's still going on. So we have an opportunity to uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, there will be uh, several folks with microphones uh, who have an opportunity for, give you an opportunity to pose your question. Um, and really, um, as was explained earlier, the first section of our discussion tonight really focuses on sort of historical questions, kind of what, um, what are some of the events that led up to where we are today in terms of questions of mass incarceration. and. Um, if we can start maybe with the gentleman on uh, over here, you raised your hand, yeah. Yes. My, my question is really simple. Why is Attica still open and what can we do to close it? Um, the, the, the endemic um, culture of racism and violence that has still existed is astounding. Um, could you speak to why is it that that culture has still remained to this day there? It's not, it's not just, I mean, right on. <laughs> And it's not just the same, it's actually worse. Uh, I mean, I have a disagreement with some people about this, about whether Attica is worse today than it was in 71. And my position is that it is worse. And one of the reasons it's worse is because the whole system has gotten most, more brutal, number one. But number two, Attica is a trauma site. And everybody that works there and everybody that's in there they live, the, 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 this like a, the rebellion is like this thing that just still exists. And the guards are very sensitive to it, right? And, and the guys pay a high price for being in this institution. So there's a lot of energy around New York City right now in the state of New York trying to shut it down. Um, the reason it's not shut down, though, has everything to do with why we can't manage to shut down enough prisons still anywhere. Uh, is enormous resistance to this for jobs reasons, but also just because of this absolute myth that somehow this makes people safer, or somehow this make this is just. Upstate Attica, um, Clinton, Elmira, Great Meadows are the biggest employers in their area. As the um, manufacturing sector has deteriorated, these prisons become more and more important. Um, they pay the best wage in the area. A union uh, corrections officer can make something like uh, $125,000 with overtime. You know, living in Dannemora or Elmira, that's a fortune. And so there's a big lobby, and a lot of it's driven by the union to keep these places open. 
So we set a pretty high bar with our first question. Uh, maybe if we can get our second question um, uh, over here. And if you, if, if folks wanna, if folks wanna ask a question, uh, 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 sir, with the glasses, if you if you wanna come over here, just um, so you can be next. Yes. Ms. Thompson, question to you. Why uh, did the state allow so many weapons that were unauthorized? Officers were not trained. They weren't, they couldn't trace who used what weapon. I mean, you say this in your book, you go into a lot on that. Could you say something about that? Yeah, it's, it's uh, if, during the retaking, the, the amount of firepower on the ground is, is, is just staggering. And, um, and it would be one thing if this all went on sort of secretly or people were showing up clandestinely with these weapons, but this was very much out in the open. And, um, and it, <laughs> frankly, because there was, there was this sense that uh, they were the ones that were gonna go in and no, it was sort of maximum deniability. If, if bad things happen, it was gonna be because of the rogue cops on the ground, right? In other words, the state officials could just deny whatever bad had happened and blame it on local law enforcement. But it sort of begs the question is why, why they were sent in to begin with, right? Um, and there's some speculation on that. First of all, Rockefeller uh, was loath to send in the National Guard. Remember, this is on the heels of Kent State. And um, he doesn't necessarily want the New York State National Guard uh, getting a bad reputation. So what he did was he put the lowest level troopers in the small town next to Attica in charge of this. They hadn't been trained for it. Half of them had never shot a 270 rifle. And um, it, it's a little hard to see this any other way than just let it go, right? Let it go and let it, let it fall where it may. All right. Um, yes, sir. Hi, good evening. I want to refer to Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. And it's her contention that the high rise of incarceration rate is due to the arrest of low-level drug offenders. I just wanted to get your feedback on that. Do you all hear the question um, in regards to really the, the relationship between mass incarceration and the war on drugs? Yeah, and uh, low-level drug offenders. And low-level drug offenders. There's no, I mean, there's no question that um, the war on drugs accounts for a huge number of people, a, the, a large percentage of the rise. But I think it's, um, we need to be aware that it was a criminalization of every space. It wasn't just about drugs. It was a turning things that had been a crime into a much worse crime than it ever had been, and then criminalizing things that had never been a crime. And that process happened at every level, from the schoolyard, you know, to people's neighborhoods, to the places where they worked. And the cumulative effect was pretty dramatic. I wouldn't normally go back this far in history, because we're talking about the 70s, but I will just give you another example of another time when this happened. It was right after the Civil War. You had four million newly freed people wanting basic things like housing and jobs and you know basic democracy and justice. And the response of white Southerners was to criminalize space in altogether new ways. And all of a sudden, you take places like the Georgia State Penitentiary, which didn't have that many people in it, and those that they did have were all white. And 20 years, it's packed and all black. And that's not because white folks stop committing crimes, and it's not because black folks lose their minds. It's a policy response, and this is the same thing that happens later. Um, the flip side of that is in New York State, with the rollback of the Rockefeller drug laws, we've actually seen a slight uh, decrease in the prison population in New York State, and we've seen a decrease in the percentage of the prison population who are African American. So it's kind of, it shows you the difference that piece of it can make. As Heather said, it's only one piece of it, but it's an important piece of it. And it's important, and thank you, Michael, it's important in another respect, which is that Rockefeller himself, of course, comes out of Attica, which is 1971, and the drug, the, rock, the so-called Rockefeller drug laws that are duplicated around the country uh, begin in 1973, and that is not coincidental. So, um, if you could just hold on to the question for uh, for a moment, we're going to take maybe just um, give you all an opportunity to talk um, less about the history of uh, Attica and mass incarceration and. Um, really a point that you all sort of touched on um, a little while earlier, which is really the, 
the difficulty of doing some of this um, either journalism or historical research, particularly when it comes to questions of incarceration. And um, I just wanted to, you, you kind of hinted at some of the difficulties that you all faced as well as some of the roundabout um, techniques that you used to get some information. And I wanted to, to see if you could speak a little bit to what was some of your motivation um, for uh, investigating these questions of either uh, the conditions in Attica in the 1970s or the conditions today, and what are some of the ways that you got, what are some of the hurdles you faced, and what are some of the ways that you got around those hurdles? Um, well, what strikes me as interesting, what Heather went through as a historian, we go through as daily newspaper reporters. Um, basically, there's only two ways you can report on prisons. One is that you ask the State Department of Corrections or the City Department of Corrections for access to a jail or prison. If you do that, you get minded the whole time. You go in and you're sitting in a room and there's a public affairs person, usually more than one, and there's usually maybe the, um, a high-ranking uh, commissioner or a superintendent. And probably most frightening to the inmate is there are correction officers. So the idea of an inmate being able to talk to you, a New York Times reporter, about brutality when there's a correction officer in the room is just not going to happen, you know, too scared. So how did we do it? Um, we went in as visitors. That's the simple answer. Um, you can go, pretty much anyone can go in as a visitor in a New York State prison um, or in the New York City jail Rikers. And we would sometimes have leads. Um, you know, we would speak to attorneys, plaintiff's attorneys, who would say, this is a terrible case, and you got to go speak to John Smith up at Great Meadows. Now, sometimes in the beginning, we would write John Smith a letter, but a lot of times those letters didn't get through. By the time you try to write John Smith and John Smith tries to write you back, it can be months and months. So you're a daily reporter, and you're a daily reporter. So we would just go up cold. We would take these trips upstate. I did it with Mike Schwartz, who's my reporting partner, the two of us. It's a lot of resources for the New York Times. I mean, they, spent, they gave us months and months and months to do these stories. And we would go from prison to prison and request to see various inmates uh, cold. Um, and they would come out and they had no idea why we were there. And we would start telling them that we understood that you had your glasses on one day and you had a uh, letter permitting you to wear these glasses and they were uh, knocked off your face and stomped by a correction officer and they ripped up um, your permit and they'd look at us and say, my God, how do you know that? You know, these are people who are buried away. They, they have they've long given up the idea that anyone understands them, has any idea of what they go to. And these two newspaper reporters from the New York Times show up and start asking these questions. Now, the last piece of this, and keep in mind, prisons, jails, they're public institutions. You pay for these places to be run. There should be, in the same way, there's a method, method there's a method, um, Yes, thank you. <laughs> methodology for getting into a, um, for a lawyer getting into a prison. There should be a methodology for a newspaper reporter. So we would do these interviews. You're not allowed as a visitor to have pen and paper. Um, so you sit there, and literally when we were done, Mike and I would run out to the parking lot car with, to our cars and just write down everything we could remember. Right? That's how we report around prisons. That's the New York Times. It's a public prison. I mean, it's crazy. And in the same vein, uh, Heather, what are some of the hurdles that you faced? Um, you detail some of them in the book. You talk about some of the sort of surprises that came about. Um, and are there ways in which some of the obstacles mirror some of what uh, Mike was just talking about? Well, very much so. And I can just, first of all, just really a shout out to uh, Michael's work. I mean, it's really incredible the work that you were able to do getting in there and, and allowing people to just tell their stories. And, and that actually was the way that I was able to get into the Attica story at first. Uh, it was really the survivors, uh, both the men kept in there and the men who worked in there, uh, sharing their stories. I mean, there is, you know, a third of the book is about the uprising. The rest of the book is both about the cover-up and, and about the struggle for justice after Attica. And that story could not have been told if it weren't for the people inside who just kept telling their stories and telling their stories and refusing, frankly, to be silenced. And so we count very much, I think, on people being able to speak 
and sometimes they can't do it until they get out. And that's why the getting in stuff is so important. I mean, imagine if prisons were these translucent cubes in the middle of Central Park, you know? You know, everybody could see everything that went on in them, right? People would be shocked, appalled, horrified. So instead, we have to go in. And in Attica, the state of New York has literally shut down the records to what happened. So in my case, get people to tell you, find lawyers who had found, who had filed suits, so there's depositions and, and their investigative materials. But frankly, you wouldn't know some of the most important things that uh, end up being in that book, namely why were so many members of law enforcement that had commit so much trauma, so much harm, not one of them, not one single person was ever held responsible. And I needed to know why that was and I wanted to know who they were and the only reason I was able to find that out was a complete accident. I found a cache of records that the state did not know was there, and those have since been disappeared. And you know, one of the amazing things about Heather's book um, is she named names. You know, it's easy to say that guards are brutal. It's a lot harder to name the guards and say, you know, who they were. And we tried to do that in our stories. Um, just one thing to what uh, that goes to what Heather said about the people you're talking to inside. We would always say the same thing. We'd say, you know, we're going to interview you. Um, we don't want to put you on the spot. We understand you probably don't want to use your name. There can be retaliation. Um, the last thing we want to do is to cause you a problem. And virtually to a man, they would say, you can use my name. Um, you know, talking about a guard who's brutal or whatever, just because they would say, we just want the story out. No one ever listens to us. It was very brave. And as a journalist, you know, who'd been doing it for 40 years and knows how often you're told this is off the record, for these men to be willing to put their names on the record is it's a brave thing. And if I'm not mistaken, in addition to those interviews, uh, the, the Times also did some work in terms of um, uh, calculating sort of uh, both quantitatively and also cataloging quantitatively um, racial bias within the prison system and also in the parole system as well, too. Yes. Um, we have a great data guy, his name is Rob Gebeloff. When people think of data, what they think about in terms of a reporter is, you know, you go out and you find something going on and you say, we need some stats for this. What Rob did was he essentially figured out a way to quantitatively um, measure racism in the New York State prison. And that is an extraordinary thing. And the way he did it was we did a foil for infractions in the prison system. You know, an infraction can be disobeying an order. An infraction can be uh, having drugs in your cell. Uh, an infraction can be assaulting an officer. And we got a hold of 60,000 of those, and Rob was able to analyze them by offense, by prison, and by race. It was extraordinary. I mean, just think of how hard it would be to quantify race. And he... Um, so we were able to say, for example, at Clinton Prison, which is up in Dannemora, it's on the Canadian border, six hour drive for any family member who wants to go see their relative up there. At Dannemora, the average white spent 90 days in solitary for the same offense that a black spent 125 days, okay? And a white, black, inmate was four times more likely to be sent to solitary than a white inmate. At that prison, through another series of reporting, we were able to show that there were 998 officers in this prison. I think maybe 60% of the inmates were African American. There was one African American officer in that whole prison. Okay? At Sing Sing, where the vast majority of offices are black or Latino, something like 83%, um, and it's closest to the city, um, the, uh, the disparity between black inmates and white inmates did not exist, okay? They were punished at an equal rate. And that's an extraordinary thing. And there are a lot, you know, it's a funny thing, you hear Sing Sing, you think this is the worst prison in hell. Sing Sing is actually the most enlightened maximum security prison in New York State. It's partly because it's close to the city. It's a 45-minute train ride away, so families can get there. Families are so important for giving support to inmates, for giving inmates a want a reason to get out. It's the Osborne Association, the Fortune Society, run college programs, art programs there. 
And so just the fact that it's so close to the city and has all these resources, it's able to much more equitably serve these inmates who are mostly from the city as opposed to Attica, Elmira, Great Meadows, Clinton, you know, six hours away, all white forces, everybody on the outside white. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a surreal thing. You go up to a place like Clinton, everyone outside the prison is white and everyone inside is black. I mean, it's an amazing thing. So um, there's something that I want to touch on in a little bit, but uh, just briefly getting back to another point that's kind of come up um, uh, from both of you all's perspectives, uh, this question of really transparency and public accountability when it comes to prisons. Uh, Heather, you mentioned this idea of putting you know, our correctional institutions in the middle of Central Park and what have you. Um, if um, we're not in a position right, where we can do that at this day and age, what are, some of the, what are some basic changes that could be made that could at least create greater um, public accountability and make it such that the sort of hurdles that you all faced, other journalists or other historians don't face as well when they're doing similar sorts of investigative, um, investigative research or reporting? You want to do it from, I can do it from a journalist. Why don't you do it from a historian? Okay. All right. So, um, I don't have an answer for that, but here's a couple of examples, right? But it's a great question. But if the government wants to help you report in a prison or a jail, they can do it. I'm going to give you two examples. I went up to the, a maximum security prison in Maine, and Joseph Pont, who came down to um, New York City and ran Rikers, was the commissioner in Maine. And they were proud of what they'd done for good reason. There were some serious reforms there. And so, we went into the prison, the main maximum security prison in Maine, and we had someone leading us around, and he had a pile of permission slips. And we'd say, we, could we speak to this gentleman, this inmate over there? And they would go, and they would take the, um, the permission slip and have the man sign it, and then he could talk to us. So they facilitated that, all right? If you go into a prison or jail, and they don't want to help you, they'll say, well, you know, there's no permission slip for it. Um, so it can happen. I can't tell you how you can get the political will to make it happen, but I can tell you, you can make the mechanics happen if you want to. I, get, I think what I would say is that, um, just as Michael points out, there's no shortage of uh, laws and rules and processes by which we could access prisons. Um, it, you know, simply upholding uh, the basic access that you would be get given under freedom of information would be enormously helpful to just start with that. But also, I mean, these as, you know, as public institutions that taxpayers fund, uh, most public institutions have an obligation for transparency and reporting, and particularly ones like prisons that have by their own uh, estimation something like a 78% failure rate. Uh, which is, you know, recidivism. So you can be sure that schools with that kind of failure rate would have everybody inside them every day trying to figure out what had happened. So I, I don't think it's a question so much of the process. I think it's really a question of the will, as Michael says. And the problem with this is that until we humanize and understand that the people inside are people, then there's no will to have access to what happens to them. And so this is really a question, it's a much, it's a more daunting, but it's also really important to face the fact that unless we deal with this as a cultural issue and understand that, you know, you, 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 everyone's children are everyone's children and to have different rules for how you would treat someone else's children should they fall afoul of the law versus your own, this is a, this is a cultural crisis and it's one that means that we will never demand access if we don't care what's happening to people inside. So, so part of this is about process, but part of it really, we've got to humanize, uh, people have to understand that people are behind bars are our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, our children, period. And then we can start looking inside. Um, I just wanted to say the parallel to what Heather's talking about in terms of access is FOIL, the Freedom of Information Law. And FOIL is only, only as good as the politicians want to make it. You can file a FOIL and you can have total, by the law, um, total uh, uh, right to get that, those documents. 
And for example, with the State Commission on Corrections in New York State, the rule was they had to get back to us in 30 days. Every time they would get back to us in 30 days and say it would be another 30 days, okay? Horrible. Just horrible. It's when I, and you know, eventually, after a couple of years, you just can't keep asking it. Um, on the other hand, if there were things the city or the state wanted to make available to us, it's remarkable how quickly it happens. One more thing I just want to say quickly. New York City has a wonderful institution that the state doesn't have and makes it much harder to deal with the state. And that's the New York City Board of Corrections. Its responsibility is to oversee the, uh, to the jails in the city. Um, and in, its success is uneven. It depends who's on the commission. But they have been great friends to reporters. And they have helped us inside. And so if you have that kind of real oversight uh, that's genuine, you have a better shot of at least on some level changing the culture. Can I just really quickly also point out that this point about politicians having control of what you see, I can't stress that enough. In my case, I happen to have the entire index of what the Attica records consisted of because a, a, an attorney general basically, maybe he didn't realize the political, uh, the political weight of having given it to me, but I have the index that says what's it, what is in box folder, you know, or, you know, box five, folder two. I, I know what's in there. So when I did freedom of information requests, I was very specific. I would like the personnel file of, you know, because I knew it was there. So when they denied me, especially as I got closer and closer and closer to who did what and who the shooters were and who had covered for whom, Basically, they, they not only denied them after a delay of two years, uh, back and forth, back and forth, but they actually said, we are denying them on the basis that there is grand jury testimony in them. Now, this is the one way that you, you can't see grand jury testimony, right, legally. But I knew there wasn't any in there because I had the index. So I knew that I wasn't asking for that. So it is willful. It's not just, you know, over, the people are overworked, bureaucrats are overworked. No, this is a, this is a willful... And, you know, I know, I know there's a story you have, Heather, but, you know, for journalists, some of it's serendipity. You just get lucky. Yeah. We had a yeah. case where we got a, um, there was a case where an a, um, inmate up at Clinton was beaten to death, and we had all kinds of information on it. And it turns out there was a civil case that we tracked down, and there was a trial up in, um, in Albany. And Mike Schwartz and I went there. We were the only ones in the courtroom, and we went there every day. And finally, the, um, the, uh, the plaintiff's attorney uh, had a video of the beating where this man, Leonard Strickland, was beaten to death. And he was going to show it in, in court. And we got our lawyers, and we, um, I, I stood before the judge, and I said we wrote a letter ahead of time why we would like it, why we thought we were entitled. And like a miracle, they gave it to us. And, you know, we posted it. It's in there. And you see a man being dragged to his death at Clinton Prison. There's, there's got to be thousands of those videos out there um, that we should be allowed to see and we're not. And we just got it because we're lucky. And don't you have a story about fumbling into boxes or something at one point? I thought I, I thought <laughs> well, if we, have t if we have time, I'll share. But yeah, okay. let, let's, right. let's... Well, just, um, why don't you share that story, actually? I don't I'm wanna, sorry, Heather. I don't want to delay get people too much. Yeah. Uh, well, 90% of what I talk about Attica is extraordinarily grim, and it's just terrible. But the story of this final fortuitous moment when I got the records had a bit of a humorous element to it because it was just such a fluke. I happened to have been calling every small town a courthouse in upstate New York asking, do you have Attica records? Do you have Attica records? Because I knew there'd been a criminal trial, a series of criminal trials. I knew there had to be some paperwork, but I just couldn't find it. And no one had it. One day, though, the Erie County Courthouse, a clerk called me and said, I think I have some Attica records. And I said, oh, my god. And at this time, I was a professor in North Carolina. I think I was making like $36,000 a year. And this is relevant, because I had no money. But I still managed to get myself on a plane immediately to get up there. And when I went into this room, which was not an archival room, it was not organized on a wall, a huge wall, probably as big as this screen, was a blizzard of papers, and it was so many Attica records, I couldn't believe it. And no matter what I kept pulling off of there, it was grand jury testimony, 
It was the same stuff was, that you weren't allowed to see exactly, when you did Freedom of Information. It was. Um, it was a magic wall. It, w it was a magic wall. It was, you know, depositions and um, autopsy reports. But most importantly, there were two documents that I, I cannot even believe I found them, honestly, in this blizzard. One of them was the whistleblowing document that a, a, a whistleblower inside of the Attica investigation had written. There was only three copies. It's what named who the shooters were, what they had done, 167 pages. And uh, one of the copies was there. And the other was a private document from the Rockefeller administration that really showed the depth of the cover-up. It showed, for example, that they had no intention of letting these guys surrender before they went in. It showed just innumerable things. And so anyway, the humorous part is I had to figure out how to get it out <laughs> because at this moment I'm contemplating, you know, grand theft myself and thought better of it. Um, but the reality was I knew that best I could do was Xerox it, and there was so much. This is before the cell phones with the, the cameras. Yeah, so I always tell my students, my, my students are always like, why didn't you just scan it? And I'm like, this is 2006. We did not have smartphones back then. Nobody had a scanner on their phone. We barely um, had phones. Exactly. A little flip phone at best. Anyway, I had to go to the clerk of court and very sheepishly uh, say, you know, well, I think you might, you have a lot of Attica papers here, and I might have said I was a history teacher, not professor. I might have said I was working on a paper, not a book. I'm not sure. Um, but, <laughs> but, but basically, I said, you know, I just can't possibly, you know, get all this down. I, you know, there's no computer in there. It's like trying to hand write all of the stuff. And so he says, well, you know, I think you could probably take some take some, uh, you know, take some copies, that would be all right. And then I realized it was a courthouse, it was $1.50 a page. And my heart just sunk because there was no way in the world I was gonna pull that off. So I asked him, I'm telling this really quickly, um, is there any way that I could just give you a, like a lump sum? And he said, well, what do you think would be fair? And mind you, I feel very, very guilty about this. I had to thank him in my book because I feel very guilty about this. Um, but he says, and I said, what do you think is fair? And I said, well, how about $200? And I said, okay. And so I wrote a check for $200. And this is important. By the way, we used to write checks. This is important because um, there's a record of what I did. And so then I had to go down there and decide what I was going to copy. And he says, so please make sure you hand all this to, you know, I don't remember her name, you know, Marge. She's going to copy it for you. And I look at this copy machine, and it's one of these deals with the lid lifts up, and you go, hmm, hmm. Mm -mm. And I freaked out because I knew that anyone could look at what I was trying to copy and just say, oh, no, mm -mm, you're not having this. So, of course, I took what I wanted, buried it between a whole bunch of stuff I didn't want, and then she starts copying, and I just start talking. Oh, my God. Oh, is that your granddaughter? Blue eyes. She's so cute. Where would you get that outfit? Is that from Target? I need that. That shirt. Do you think they have it in my size? I talked like a crazy person and she just basically was like mm -mm. she wanted to get me out of there so I did get the documents out a week before the book came out because it was embargoed I didn't want this book to be shut down or you know someone to sue to shut it down um, I got a call from a reporter <laughs> who um, heard that I had found the records in Erie County and I freaked out a little bit um, because I was afraid if he tipped them off that somehow the records would disappear. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. They, all, they first told him there were no records, there never had been. Then they told him that there was, in fact, records. There was one box, and when he went to look at it, it was a box only of the prisoner indictments. And you have to understand the significance of that. It means that someone had to go through thousands and thousands of pages and pull out what was public domain and only, you know, implicated prisoners, and God knows what happened to everything else. But I did get the copies, I did ultimately scan them, <laughs> and save them to Dropbox and 10 other sites, so I do have them. But, I mean, but can you imagine, think about the scary part of that, though, that an entire history of one of our most important fundamental human rights struggles in American history, that the key details of it rested on one crazy moment of someone saying, I think I have some Attica records here. I mean, we, th that's just shameful. But you know, that goes on more than you'd think. Yeah. I mean, to me, what I take from Heather is the incredible persistence. 
Same, you know, if you're given a year, two years, you keep coming back and back and back, and those things happen to you eventually. And, you know, you don't work eight hours a day. You know, it's like Heather said, you get on a plane and you go. So um, it's, it's commitment. And whether it's a historian or a, you know, a newspaper, um, it, you know, it's expensive. It's, uh, it takes a lot of resources to keep a couple of reporters going for a year on one prison store. And I think one of the things, well, first of all, it's a wonderful story, and I'm glad that we had a chance to hear it. And then two, I think it, it speaks to one, how important control over information is in a, in a fundamental way, particularly for um, a cover-up as extensive as the one that took place um, in the wake of the Attica Rebellion, during the course of it, really, and in the wake of it. Um, and one that sort of, in some ways, continues to this day. Um, and in similar ways, how, um, although it's not as um, organized as a cover-up that took place under the Rockefeller administration, how we're denied consistently information about what takes place behind bars. And at least we have gotten an opportunity to get some you know, tips or suggestions in terms of how to deal with some of those obstacles. Can I just say that, I know we're serious, but this is important, the, the cover-ups still go on every day. Um, right now, we have a real crisis, not just in New York prisons, but in prisons across the country, of deaths in custody, where nobody knows, well, people know what happened, but the families are not allowed to get autopsies for the people that have been killed. Everyone's got their story straight for how so-and-so died. No one tells the truth about what happened, and it just gets swept under the rug. And that's probably, I mean, I don't know, a weekly basis, Michael? I mean, this happens all the time. And so it is cover-up, capital C, in the same way that Attica was. That video I described to you, the elderly mom in that, um, it took days before they called from the prison to tell them that they didn't say her son was beat to death. They said he had died. Um, and they gave her um, a, um, I think she was Baptist, and a Catholic priest came to her door and told her a little bit about what happened in Brooklyn and gave her a number to call at the prison, the social worker. And she calls the social worker, and the social worker says, well, I re can't really discuss it. It's under investigation. You know? And, you know, it's tough enough being a New York Times reporter or being a historian and knowing how to game the system and go, but if you're an elderly woman, you know, who uh, doesn't have a lot of money, um, you're powerless. So we're going to have an opportunity to open it up for questions again, um, just by a show of hands if folks are interested in asking a question. I know we, we skipped one last time. Maybe if we could start with you, sir. Sure. after waiting patiently, and then uh, we could start with the, the young man in the back um, and then work our way forward. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of fascinating things that you're, that you're talking about. I have lots of questions, but I'm going to go back to one that I had from when you were talking about history. And um, I, I think it has some relevance to a lot of these other issues. Um, and that has to do with um, how people or how society sees the purpose of incarceration or the, or the purpose of justice. And I wonder, you know, is it, is it just public safety or just punishment? Is there also the idea of, of, I don't know, helping people, you know, move on to better lives? You know, um, I know there's you know, for a lot of people, that's, um, that's, I don't know, threatening or goes against the idea of punishment, revenge. So it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's pretty polarizing. But I guess I, w I wonder how, you know, just some historical perspective on that's, how that's changed and whether or not you see or seeing any change in trends now, now that the issue of mass incarceration is becoming uh, more public and is starting to get talked about, I think, starting to get talked about in a different way. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great and very complicated question. I mean, the short answer is that um, people have all kinds of ideas about what they think prison does, but historically, when you look back over time, prison populations rise in response to political, social, upheaval, disruption, and they do, it does not track with crime rates in the way you would expect, either positively or negatively. And so the first thing is, it's largely divorced from crime, believe it or not, and I know people are thinking, what is she talking about? I mean, 
obviously you commit a crime, you go to prison, but in the, in the aggregate sense, prisons are much more a response to social disruption and upheaval than they are crime. Be, and here's what's important about that. Because in fact, if we think about what do we want to do when it comes to actually the issue of violence and crime, we think about, well, what would you do with your own family? If you had a child that was mentally ill, if you had a child that committed a terrible harm against another who's not mentally ill, if you had a child who was a duck, drug addicted and you had resources, the last person you would call is the police and the second last thing you'd want to happen would be for them to end up in prison. You would come up with a million other options for dealing with that situation to make it better, to make us all safer, and to make that person have a second chance in life. So this idea that those are meant to do those things, I don't think people really believe that, actually, because if they did, they'd bring it to their own living room. Um, this is a little peripheral to the question, but I think it touches on some of the same things. Um, you could look at what goes on in prisons as a human rights violation. You can try to view it through that prism. And when we were doing the Rikers stories, and I don't know if we'll get to Rikers, but there have been some significant reforms at Rikers um, that have come out of some of the muckraking in the U.S. Attorney. But we were able to come across a report that literally chronicled over a period of a year how many inmates had broken bones and how many inmates were taken to um, emergency rooms off Rikers Island. And so that almost became an objective way to look at it and to quantify it, all right? So if you have 129 inmates, as we wrote, who've had some bro bone broken at Rikers and they were so badly beat up that they had to be taken off the island, it gives you sort of a human rights standard you, that you can begin to create in the same way they're looking to do those things in Bosnia and around the world. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a different way to think about it, but I think it has promise. And just to the, um, one, of, one, of the one of the kind of uh, strains in the question was this tension between punishment and rehabilitation to some degree. Um, and in many ways, we're sort of in a moment of mass incarceration. It sort of moved wholesale away from the idea of rehabilitation. Um, and one of the things that I think um, is demonstrated in Heather's book is really the ways in which um, the rebellions that took place during the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s in prisons across the country were taking place at a moment where the idea of rehabilitation was very much um, ingrained in the policy of how many prisons were managed. And even at that time, you had prisoners um, raising concerns about the way in which um, while there might be a surface commitment to helping prisoners to some degree improve, improve themselves, rehabilitate themselves, and what have you, there was still um, an inordinate amount of brutality that took place behind bars, a lot of deprivation in terms of the living conditions and the working conditions as well, and uh, a fair amount of racism as well in terms of the ability to access the kind of um, uh, educational programs or uh, religious services, uh, or social programs that were uh, fundamental to kind of any policy of rehabilitation. And I think we might be in a moment where some of the very kind of, um, kind of hardcore focus simply on sort of locking people away and throwing away the key is breaking down a little bit. But um, one of the things, and I think this, this gets to some of your reporting in the New York Times, is like if we're not able to get at the, the dynamics of racism in terms of the way in which um, uh, these institutions are operating, we might find ourselves facing a similar sort of dynamic as occurred during the early 1970s where there's a sort of um, surface level and maybe even a, a deeper, somewhat of a deeper commitment to rehabilitation, but um, that's um, really, um, uh, the, it's really kind of, you know, uh, hypocritical in some ways because um, racism very much undermines how, um, how concretely that is, you know, that's realized. So, um, real quickly, if we can get a question. Uh, yeah, my um, my question you. may lead to alternative questions, but simply I want to know what is, what are we doing initiative-wise to destabilize and kind of destructure the unions, the civil servant unions? They're not holding these officers, correctional staff and administration, all alike. Nobody's holding them accountable. What organizations are working to actually destructure that or come up with new policies to weaken their labor union? 
because I'm formerly incarcerated. So I've seen the officers be suspended for incidents involving broken ligaments or death, and they'll be out of the facility for a few months, and the next thing you know, you see them back in the same facility, working the same post. I mean, I've been in the SHU confinements. There's no cameras in there, and the small ones. I can't speak for upstate box, but I know in the small ones, there's no um, surveillance system. So there's no way to actually record what's taking place in the strip search procedures. There's no accountability at all. And I've been in the Clinton Hub. I was in Clinton Reception. I went down to Bear Hill Correctional Facility, which is a medium. Still in that hub area, so the travel distance mm -hmm. is still the same. But there's no accountability. And it's a cult-like mentality with the staff. So the officers, they dominate there. So you'll have administrative staff, super, um, deputy superintendent of administration that's not holding these officers accountable because they're afraid to be ostracized on the job. So I want to know what are we doing? to stop the union power or held the union more accountable for holding these officers accountable? That's a very big, very smart question. Um, the, we've written about those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, liberals and progressives in particular are very um, supportive of unions. Um, but in the correction world, uh, unions are off, often the number one obstacle to reform. Uh, we found that on Rikers Island and we found that in the state prison system. Um, now, in terms of some of the improvements you can make, um, the, the story of Rikers really hasn't been told in its entirely, you know, the right way. But there have been some extraordinary changes there. And there's, uh, just very quickly, the changes have been because the New York Times and the AP reporters got interested and were committed for a couple of years. Uh, Brie Barrara, U.S. attorney, great U.S. attorney, very aggressive. Um, most of the bads at the time had been... Um, it coincided with the Bloomberg administration going out and the de Blasio administration coming in. So the de Blasio administration had no, no political capital on, you know, a problem with exposing the problems. And what you got as a result is they put thousands of more uh, video cameras in, in the Rikers jails, right? That's an improvement. The Bronx DA has been more aggressive about prosecuting cases. For the first time, they're beginning to get some of these, um, these uh, correction officers. There was one case, I think 10 guys um, were convicted. Um, it still is a small fraction, but um, it, it, you know, it, it sounds, it's ironic because Rikers sounds like, the, it's like Sing Sing, it sounds like the worst place in the world. But some of the most aggressive reforms in the penal world have been going on at Rikers. Um, you know, there's still a very basic problem, which is it's Rikers. It's on that island, and they got to get it off. Um, but it seems like it's moving in that direction. So the the heart of your question, though, is it's it's a bear trying to do anything about that. The uh, offices control everything. The union is so powerful. Commissioners come and go. Reporters come and go. But the union and the offices are always there. Just really quickly, I want to first of all say welcome home, and secondly, um, the answer to your question is also that folks like yourself have to be at the forefront of this moment, right? Because you know, you know what what goes on, and and you can tell everybody else what goes on that nobody else can see, and that's one of the reasons why I think Rikers. It's not just the reporters, it's not just the historians, the reporters, and the politicians. Rikers and Attica. The light was shone there so powerfully because of people like, you know, Khalif Browder, because people who the rallied, formerly incarcerated people have been mobilizing and stepping up and saying not in our name and shut it down. And, and you know, and that's not just pie in the sky. I mean, we wouldn't know about Attica if it hadn't been for the Attica brothers. And we wouldn't have, you know, none of this stuff is even possible uh, if uh, we don't do this in conjunction with folks such as yourself telling us what's going on. So I think that's, and, and there's a lot of organizations like that in New York trying to do that stuff. One of, one of the ones I particularly support, Alliance of Families for Justice, Sophia Elijah's organization, you know, Just Leadership. I mean, there's just so many. Uh, but in addition to that, the probes, the lawsuits, and the accountability. So we have time for one more question, and then uh, the folks who didn't get an opportunity to ask this time around, we're going to have one more round of question and answers. It's a little bit of a different format, but hopefully it'll give us an opportunity to dig deeply on kind of each of the different aspects of some of what we're, we're discussing. Um, well, let's go over here and then see how much time we have left. Um, you started to talk about this with respect to Rikers, but I'll put the question more precisely. 
Um, how has the state and city governments reacted specifically to the publication of your works? And is the reaction something you expected? Um, the city government, as I said before, has been very responsive. And it's because a lot of these problems that just were you know, coming to a boil at the start of uh, the de Blasio administration can be traced to the Bloomberg administration, which neglected the jail for years. I mean, Bloomberg put a lot of energy in improving the city in a lot of places, but he put nothing in the jails. I think what someone told us that he visited Rikers, I think, uh, or he called the commissioners twice in the course he was mayor in 12 years. So, you know, that was part of the moment. There was, the, the de Blasio administration has spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to improve that jail, all right? Now, the flip side is you can get, um, you know, people just giving lip service. We did those big stories on uh, racism in the uh, state prisons, and Cuomo, the next day, Governor Cuomo said, we're gonna do a big study, and we're going to, you know, see if we can duplicate what the New York Times did, and see if there really is racism in those prisons, and they've done nothing, okay? From a political point of view, it's very smart. You know, they said, oh, great, New York Times did this great investigation. We're going to get it on immediately. You know, story Monday, second story Tuesday, investigation Wednesday. Every reporter dreams about it, but nothing's come of it. So it's, um, you know, it's, a lot of it's hit or miss, and a lot of it takes community groups making a difference. If they really do shut Rikers down, it's, you know, it's the community groups that are doing that, you know, the advocacy groups, not the newspapers. So uh, we, we have time for maybe one more question, if, yes. you, if you Yeah, so I, I do feel that reporters are really important to the conversation and historians are really important to the conversation. I do feel like panels like these should always include the voices of those who are formerly, formerly incarcerated. And I feel like it, it, it's not effective until that happens. And then another thing that I want to say is that I feel like the system of prison and policing is operating the way that is designed to operate. So it was operated, you know, criminalizing black people, um, profiting off of labor, like all of that stuff is designed to do that. Um, and we, I think it's important to like know that. And so my question to you is knowing that people in this room may be people who call the police on black and brown people when they see them doing petty crimes, such as like, engaging in marijuana or things like that, and they call 911, which essentially leads into incarceration. Um, knowing that people in the room may be pro-police or police officers, knowing that people in the room may also be correction officers, what can you share with us as your views on abolition and shutting down the whole incarceration system? Is the question basically how we can and our system of incarceration and rebuild it? Is it, is it? So the question, she, she was saying that the, the question is basically what are your thoughts on abolition? And I think part of the point about the, the folks in the audience is you have an opportunity to speak to people who, um, as bad as the system is that you're describing, um, might find themselves participating in it, right? Uh, contributing to it, contributing to the dynamic of mass incarceration. And if we were going to move away from that, if we were going to move towards prison abolition, what can we say to the people here as to what, what are the reasons why that's important? Well, if I might, if I might um, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that you can't, do, you can't do the history of the system, you can't have family members in the system, you can't know the system and think that you can fix it in its current configuration, not close, because at the fundamental premise, you are caging human beings, full stop. And you're not having equal justice under the law, not close. And so I guess, you know, there's a, a huge argument for, well, let's start with bringing some equal justice under the law, and let's start with ending some of the brutality, and let's start, and right on to that too, but at the end of the day, the system itself, the prison itself, the criminalization, the policing, what we don't understand because we don't have any sense of long-term history is that it's new. It's a really new way of doing things. Not all societies and systems and societies and systems in world history have handled uh, social ills in the way that we do and in this way. So right on to that. 
and, uh, and also right on to sessions having formerly incarcerated folks in them. And indeed, I want to give a real shout out because we have a lot of folks in here doing really important work that uh, as soon as these books are get published, will be up here and uh, sharing that work, absolutely. But thank you for that question. Um, one, uh, one additional point in, to the, to the, before we, before we move back to, um, kind of our last round of questions, I just wanted to speak to the question that was asked around holding guards unions accountable. And, um, just one thing that comes up, just thinking about your book, Heather, that, um, there was a moment in Attica and I think in the, in the several years after Attica where you had prisoners organizing but also looking to build prisoner unions. Sometimes those were prisoner labor unions, sometimes those were um, just organizations that were able to represent the interests and concerns of those who were incarcerated. And I think it would be in a, a potential counterweight, obviously not maybe as strong as the guards unions, but if prisoners had the ability to organize as labor unions on the inside as was being proposed in 1971, 72, 73. And um, also you had formerly incarcerated people who had their own uh, union on the outside, that those two, yeah. kind of that level of organization might be some sort of counterweight to what the power that the guards are able to That's a exercise. hugely important point. And by the way, you all should know that Tucson has done this amazing book on prisoner rights movements, which you should all get, and doing his own work on uh, a big, bigger book on uh, an uprising in Illinois. So the question comes from a great deal of <laughs> information on this. And absolutely, I mean, there is a moment when prisoners try to unionize. It is shut down at the Supreme Court level. And that's the end of that legally, but it certainly has not been the end of prisoners organizing in the form of a union. Certainly the uh, whole rash of prison work stoppages that happened uh, in 2006 on the anniversary of Attica happened. Uh, uh, from prison organizing and a union, if not so endorsed by the Supreme Court, certainly acted that way. Um, I will also just note on unions, um, it's really, I, I'm also a labor person in, in my core, and the reality is that working people should organize in unions, and you know, this is a, this is a question of human rights in the workplace. And the problem is with guards, we get really distracted by both, frankly, the New York Guards Union and the California Guards Union, because I'll be, in, in my opinion, they're not unions. First of all, both of those are professional organizations that broke away from uh, AFSCME Union in the case of New York and a different union in the case of California. Um, and if you look at unions in general around the country, the societies that have the worst, or the states that have the worst incarceration rates, those aren't unionized guards. The states that have the worst incarceration rates are anti-union state, anti states. So we gotta break this down a little bit. The problem with the, the New York Guards Unions, the problem with the California Guards Unions is that they act like employer organizations and they're defending the indefensible. Many unions right now, particularly AFSCME unions, are fighting prison privatization and they're fighting a lot of this stuff. And their position actually officially is, we're not fighting to keep prisons open, we're just fighting for good jobs, meaning, we don't even want to work at a prison, but we want jobs in our community. So it's complicated. I have a different view on some of this, these things, um, and I have more questions than the answers. First of all, having reported the wrong prisons a fair amount, I don't think you're going to have any kind of effective uh, inmates um, union uh, movement because all the strings are controlled by the administration. I mean, people get transferred. You know, if you have someone considered a troublemaker, they'll move him to a different prison. If you have some kind of, you know, small little uprising at Clinton, they'll take each person and move them around to a different prison around the state. So, and the idea that in any way that could rival these labor unions, um, you know, I'm gonna throw one out here I have no answer for. I have, we have documented um, brutality in Rikers, and we've uh, documented brutality in the state. Um, serious problems each place. We've d documented all you know, racial problems in the state. The Rikers Union, which is um, every bit as brutal as the state union, is, is something like 80% African American, okay? I don't have an answer for the question I'm gonna ask. Um, I told you that Sing Sing is a lot better place because it's 85% African American, the in 
the officers. So, but I don't know why this goes on in the city. We keep asking the question, and we'll hear, well, people come from the same neighborhoods, different sides of the street, this is the good guy, this is the bad guy. So these things are very complicated, and you know, I'm as an outsider, probably as immersed as an outsider can be, and I don't have answers for these things. Well, one thing we do know, just, and I really appreciate that, 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 that nuance of how can they still be so brutal even if there are these closer relationships and even if you take a little bit of the racial power dynamic out of it. And I think it ties back to this woman's question about the problem with prisons in general. Or, right. you know, the, the, the problem is these institutions are brutal. It's the way they're structured. They, you know, you got the keepers and the kept. And so, you know, without huge amounts of transparency and eyes on it at all times, the Stanford prison experiment showed us a hell of a long time ago right. that there's going to be brutality. And whether the guard is white or black, you know, it's an unchecked system. I, I just very quickly wrote about a trial up in Ossining where they had a videotape of an officer beating the crap out of an inmate. I mean, it was, and they played it in court. And the superintendent of Sing Sing came to that trial and testified that that guard should be fired and um, that that's not acceptable behavior and they should come down on him and I don't want him working in my prison. Mm -hmm. And a jury of Austin, from Austin, which is, you know, it's a prison town, um, found the guard not guilty and the uh, Department of Corrections uh, disciplinary um, um, system which tried to get rid of the guard failed because it's so geared, it's so slanted towards the union, and that guard is still working there. You know, so it's hard to, if you're an outsider, to understand just how biased and how, um, you know, what a kangaroo court exists in this whole system. So we have a number of people who want to ask questions, and I think that's probably the best way for us to go. But I do want to just um, uh, just suggest to you all because we've been kind of more on a, the, the, I don't want to leave too much of an, obviously this is a, a terrible social problem that we need to deal with. I don't want to leave too much of a negative cast. And if you all at some point can just touch on or lift up one either um, positive development that you've seen within the sort of New York, either city or state correctional system um, of late and then, uh, and or any sort of reforms in regards or changes in regards to, um, prison policy that you that you think folks need to lift up and carry with them when they leave. And, you won very quickly. Well, well let's, okay. let's go to the questions, and sure. if, if it comes up in the conversation, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you talk about Rikers. Brooklyn Defenders did a huge fundraiser just before Christmas to try to uh, raise, uh, give people to donate um, thermal underwear because the inmates there were freezing, literally, almost literally to death. So I think we've got a long way to go on Rikers. Um, well, thank you all for the work that you do. Um, there's been much said about the past and our current inequities um, in, associated with mass incarceration, but how will a fractured and NIMBY community welcome home thousands of men and women who are about to return to the very neighborhoods you know, that sent them there when access to health care and, and affordable housing and jobs um, are scant in those very neighborhoods? I mean. We're, how are we going to wrap our arms around these people and bring them back home? And maybe, um, so we have the, the re-entry question, and maybe if we take another one, and we'll take a couple questions in pairs just so we have an opportunity to, to hear from folks. Yeah, yeah my question is a little related to that. Um, it, I think that the uh, stigma of drug addiction makes it very difficult for even advocates to address how f profound an issue that is in the correctional system. But that's what gets people, in many cases, behind bars. It's the main thing, the main um, fueling of uh, recidivism. A lot of people die of overdoses when they get out. And there is no one in New York State prisons, with the exception of a few pregnant women, who were receiving the community standard of care for treatment of opioid addiction, which is medication. And the medications that should be available, methadone and buprenorphine, which are used all over the world for treating addiction are not available to the people who need it immediately and, and dramat dramatically. So either on the topic of 
um, dealing with opioid addiction or on this question of this broader question of rehabilitation, not just rehabilitation, but reentry for people who are coming home? Well, they're related, and, they're, yeah. and what, what ties them together is the absolute lack of will to treat social ills as social problems, not criminal justice problems, to treat uh, you know, addiction as a criminal justice problem, not a public health problem. And the reality is that all of the, there have been uh, uh, some notable and marked reforms of the criminal justice system. I'm, you know, Michael is sharing with us and, and will in a moment share more of what's happening locally. I come at this much more nationally. I was on a national academies panel to, to look at this stuff from the federal, federal vantage point. And I can tell you, in 2012, I mean, it was pretty remarkable. We were on this moment of pretty amazing criminal justice reform, 2013, 2014. But you know where the rubber always met the road? It was on this question of resources. We could get the right and the left in D.C., well, okay, the, 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 the right and the not so right, in D.C. to, de to decide that, uh, you know, this was a mistake and we should do it differently. We could all agree on that. We could all agree maybe we should roll back the drug laws. We could all agree that maybe we should do this a little bit differently. But when it came to the question of what are we going to do next, that's where everything fell apart, right? That was, you know, everyone could agree, you know, you need a college education, you need a high school degree because that'll help you not go to prison. But then when it came to, so are you going to support public education? It was just like, well, no, I didn't say that. And so I am optimistic, but actually every moment of real criminal justice reform we've had, and it was true at the federal level, it's true at the local level, has been pushed from the streets, it has been pushed when the communities stand up. And I will tell you that some of the most important moments of criminal justice discussion that were happening in D.C. happened, not just because some senator woke up and one day said, oh, you know what, I'm, this is kind of bothering me, this whole criminal justice situation, I think we need to fix it. It was because Ferguson was on fire, Baltimore was on fire, and they basically just said, holy crap, right? We got, you know, so I, I'm optimistic, but I'm also worried. <laughs> um, those are such hard questions. I wish I had the answers. I, I really don't. I, I do know that if you look at the uh, oxycodone crisis, um, it's being looked at much more from a rehabilitative point of view because it's a white crisis a lot more. I think there's a very different attitude. You have very, very conservative politicians who are um, who are rallying, saying it's not a crime, it's an illness. Um, you know, so, so that goes to race. I mean, I could tell you, I, I don't have any answer for how you embrace people coming out of prison. It's political will. Uh, it's about overcoming racism. I mean, I think the basic reason our prisons are so bad in this country is race. Um, we're not all one people, we're two people, all right? And we have to punish the people we're not. You know, and that goes, I think, on a very simple level to to what the problem is. Um, you know, in terms of more short term, um, there have been improvements in solitary. Now, I don't know all the details. I've been away for it from over a year. But Rikers is one of the first city jails in the country to abolish solitary from everyone 21 and under. You know, now I know it's been bumpy, and I know there are ways to say you're abolishing solitary when you're not. But all in all, you know, that, that reform has been made. Same on the state. Um, the New York Civil Liberties uh, Union um, has done some great work with the state prisons, um, cutting down the maximum length of uh, solitary, saying that you can't get solitary for certain um, offenses like disobeying an order or getting caught smoking um, you know, uh, marijuana, that you can't get solitary for that. So there has been progress on those levels. And there's been progress in education programs. But to get to your question, systematic change, um, I don't know, I'm a newspaper reporter, but I'm really not optimistic about that. Not, it's not the easiest question in the world. Yeah. And just um, something also for, I think, for us to think about as we go, uh, as, we, you know, as we leave from here, but to make sure that we have an opportunity just to hear a, a last couple rounds of questions. Very brief questions, right? Um, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from folks on both sides of the, um, both sides of uh, uh, the hall here, and um, uh, we'll give you guys an opportunity to answer and also offer some closing thoughts as well. So, okay, Michelle? really great, uh, really quick. Um, okay, so we already know that prison unions don't exist. We know that internal investigators in prisons are jokes. 
because they're part of the same good old boy club as, as, as the uh, correctional officers. So my question for you is, there are external oversight mechanisms in New York. You know, there are prison association organizations that have been in existence since the early 20th century that are supposed to provide oversight of prisons. And so what I want to know, in your research, looking at what was happening inside these prisons, did you find them as a resource to help, um, to help give you some insight on what was going on inside? Or were they also jokes? Um, oh, no, the, they, weren't, they weren't also okay. jokes. The Correctional Association of New York has a legal mandate that goes back, I think, to about 1850, where they are permitted into the prisons as observers um, to see that they, uh, the state cannot bar them from the prisons. I mean, they restrict them and they make it more difficult, but they were, they were a huge help to us. I mean, when you're a reporter, you know, you're uneducated. You don't know what's going on, and you have to start someplace. Someone has to teach you. And the Correctional Association, and, the, and there were others, the Osborne Association, the Fortune Society, you know, have all edu helped educated me and other people at the Times. Um, you know, Jack Beck with the Correctional Association, you know, he's, I can't tell you how much he has taught me. So, you know, th there are good groups, and, and, and they are out there trying, and it's an uphill battle. Um, but, you know, sometimes there are victories. So just briefly, and we can try to take this as quickly as we can. Okay, uh, my name is Carl Dix, and I feel like any discussion of incarceration and criminal justice reform today has to take into account that we're in the era of Trump. And I know there's been a lot of resistance around mass incarceration and criminal justice. I was involved in organizing some of it. But now you've got a regime holding the reins of power that are bringing back mandatory minimums, have put the government back into the business of contracting with private prisons, using it right now to put immigrants in, but then also taking the gloves off the police, getting ready for citizens who happen to be black and brown, because the white supremacy is going to direct this. So I feel like. One of the questions that has to be addressed is what does this regime holding the reins of power mean for how criminal justice, how mass incarceration is going to go? I happen to feel like we need to drive the shithole in chief out before it's too late because I don't know where he's going to stop with the stuff that he's doing. Th thank but I'll pose the question. I'm going to stop you. right there. And um, be we'll just, we're going to try to take the last couple questions as well, too. So uh, thank you. So my question actually goes off that a little bit. So uh, I didn't hear a lot of discussion of the role of prosecutors in all of this. And you know, we have Democratic prosecutors in our major cities that are sending all these people to state prison and are certainly keeping them in the city facilities. Um, so what do you see the role as a prosecutor um, from overcharging to um, delaying prosecutions as really oftentimes not people who support Trump, but Democrats who are elected by people in this room like Cy Vance? Um, you know, how do you guys uh, see that as fitting into this whole discussion? And, and last but not least. Hi. Um, I actually work on arraignments at Manhattan Criminal Court, and I so I kind of see people's first entry into the system, and I'm wondering, and I see people coming back through all the time. I'm wondering where you see uh, the like where you can see reform actually happening. Is it more in prevention and getting to the communities earlier in education? Is it more in um, reentry in terms of the tail end, or and if you could talk about that, and also like how it relates to the. You know, it's a lot of drug addiction, um, lack of housing, and mental health issues. So I'm just wondering, where do you see the, the greatest area for change that we could actually make an impact in, rather than just sitting here and lamenting the problem, but actually change something? Um, just, I guess, really quick round robin answers to, to the last question first. Um, my, my experiencing looking at it more at a macro level is that the most, the most kind of exciting energy, positive energy, has actually been going into reentry, and I fully support that for all the reasons we spoke of earlier. But I'm kind of appalled at how little is going into the uh, front end of it. And in fact, a lot of the front end stuff is already through the criminal justice system. So, you know, again, like. <laughs> bringing police into schools to make schools safer, which in fact then makes them, you know, the conduit to incarceration. I'm, so 
reentry is, I think, where it's going. We need more on the front end. Um, Trump, yes. <laughs> but on the other hand, the, the next comment about um, everybody's hands are, everybody's fingers are sticky, everyone's hands are dirty. I mean, the reality is this is a bipartisan situation. Um, Republicans and Democrats alike got us into this. Republicans and Democrats alike hold the reins to uh, keeping it as it is. And so I, I, I'm less confident that we can change our way out of this by just simply changing who the president is. The, you know, the uh, question on prosecutors, uh, very good. Um, you want a model for how it should be done, pre Ferrara. I mean, he went hard after um, the brutality at the Rikers jail, and he absolutely squeezed the city. The city was, uh, this is the de Blasio administration, Zachary Carter, they were stalling and dragging their feet on whether they were gonna put a monitor in the, uh, it, they were gonna agree to that. There was a big lawsuit that legal services had brought, and Barrara basically said, you know, the night before his press conference, he said, you guys do this or we're gonna drag you through court. And the city blinked, okay? And, and that's how they got to monitor in the prison. So, um, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but the, I, Bob Johnson, who used to be the DA in, um, in the Bronx, was terrible about this stuff. But the woman who's the DA there uh, now, I have the impression, is much better at it. Do you know who I'm talking? Um, anyway, I think she's much more even-handed. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, a good prosecutor knows when not to prosecute, or a good prosecutor sees both sides. Just as a, maybe as a final thought, and this touches on at least some of the questions regarding um, the prosecutor, one of the, I think, the most exciting and sort of hopeful events that, that I've had an opportunity to see was the, um, the election of Larry Krasner in Philadelphia as a district attorney, not because he was a sort of quote unquote Black Lives Matter attorney or what have you, but um, uh, there, was a, there were a number of uh, stories about his election that detailed the way in which uh, you had prisoners who were upstate in Pennsylvania, who were from Philadelphia, um, very much aware of what um, his election could mean, not only in terms of the prosecution of um, uh, criminal offenses, but also the potential for um, convictions that had already been put in place to be overturned, and were contacting their family members and encouraging them to go out and vote for him. And really that uh, question of involvement of uh, not just formerly incarcerated, but incarcerated people in uh, the democratic processes today, I think bodes, um, you know, bodes a lot for the potential that we can have for really uh, not just changing uh, and sort of pushing forward reforms, but finding ways to make it possible for those who are locked up to have more of a role in uh, uh, improving the way in which our society operates. I think that's good. I also was thinking as you were speaking, um, there are diversion courts, and um, I've seen them and they can be effective. There are mental, I know a lot about mental health. I've been writing about it for a long time. And the diversion, mental health diversion courts in New York City is um, they're pretty good. I mean, they will stand there, now they're intrusive. They will have someone come up there and the judge is literally reading a list and he's saying, I see you missed your meds on Wednesday. And this is going on in a New York State Supreme Court. And why did you miss, you know, uh, miss your meds, uh, meds on Wednesday? Um, and there's jaw boning back and forth. But there are efforts, it takes a tremendous amount of resources. I mean, the number of social workers in a mental health diversion court is just, it's staggering. Uh, it, the relationship is almost one on one between the, um, um, the people who are accused uh, um, and the people who are delivering the services. But it's a hopeful model. Yeah. Heather, did you I'm, want? I'm against that. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, did you want to, did well, you have I a closing just, thought? I, I, I sort of think it's interesting because we were talking about high politics for a moment, who's in the White House, but coming back to prosecutors and judges and, and lawyers is a really important place, I think, for us to come back because, again, I'm just reminded in my own book and, and of the many stories um, Michael's told tonight that, um, you know, it, it makes a huge difference uh, who judges are. It makes a huge difference who, who the prosecutors are. And what we haven't talked at all about is it makes a huge difference whether the, whether the public defender system is robustly supported and whether it has any 
uh, teeth, any legs, any whatever <laughs> metaphor, whatever you want to use uh, to describe it. We have gutted the, the public defender system in this country, and um, it, it shows, right? Because if you look at the Attica story, one of the most extraordinary moments in Attica is when the state of New York, I just told you, they held all the cards, they had guns, they shot and tortured people, they covered it all up, but guess what? Grassroots level, lawyers, law students, um, basically, and community activists descended on upstate New York and held those people accountable anyway. And um, so it, it matters. I mean, the legal, the legal piece of this matters a lot, I think. So I want to, um, if you could join me in thanking our, our panelists for uh, the presentation tonight. Thank you all for joining us. And um, I want to thank uh, the folks at uh, New York Humanities for sponsoring this event, uh, Harvard University Press, um, and H, Pulitzer, all of exactly, them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I just want to thank you for being here tonight. I mean that you care about these things and you've come. You know, it's um, it means a it means a tremendous amount. That and hopefully, and hopefully the conversation that we had tonight is not, you know, this is not the close of it, but really an opportunity for us to kind of continue some of the discussion that took place here, for you all to take it with you all, and for us to really get to doing the kind of work that needs to happen to make the sort of changes that we've talked about just on, on a surface level um, during the time that we had. So thank you. <laughs>